join me? Walk in the light. Walk. Christmas to all of you. We thank you so much for joining us this morning virtually. We pray that you are having a wonderful Christmas morning and that you are having time surrounded by family and loved ones. And we pray that this is a time of refreshing for you as we celebrate the advent of our Savior, Jesus, who is the Christ. Don't want to belabor the time, so I want to jump right into the Word. If you got your Bibles this morning, I'm going to ask if you would meet me in the first chapter of the first book of the New Testament, Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. Prayerfully, you are there with me this morning. Um, I'm going to read... Beginning at the 18th verse, I'm reading from the English Standard Version, Matthew chapter 1, beginning at verse 18. It reads, Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and Unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her 
quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for, what, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Would you bow with me and let's pray and ask his help as we delve into his word together today. Holy and all righteous God, we come to you and we thank you that we have the privilege to call you Father. We thank you, Lord God, that we have the opportunity to know you and to be loved by you and to experience that love and to experience the, the joy and peace that comes with relationship with you, God. Father God, we thank you so much for Christmas. We thank you for the very reason that we as believers choose to celebrate during this time. Our, our hearts, uh, our hearts praise and worship during this holiday is, is a heart of gratitude for you sending your son, Jesus, who willingly comes in the form of man, takes on the form of humanity so that he could save our souls. From sin, death, and judgment. We thank you, Lord God, that it's through Jesus we have relationship with you and with one another. Lord God, as we delve into the word today, I pray that we spend this time, Lord God, considering our reasons, the reason that as followers of Jesus we celebrate during this time, that that's kept into focus, Lord God, that it's not lost upon us, and all of the traditions and all of the nostalgia of the moments that we are enjoying and experiencing, Lord God, and even if there's an absent of absence of those things, Lord God, I, I pray that you would deposit into each one of our hearts, each one that is listening and watching in this moment, that you'd deposit in our hearts a sense of gratitude and gratefulness and thankfulness that we have a Savior that's come for us. We love you and we thank you. It's in the matchless and powerful name of Jesus we pray. Amen. This morning we jump into Matthew's uh, telling of the Christmas story, that first Christmas that we experience uh, in the Word of God where we experience the birth of Jesus. And, and, and we get to see here that as we uh, come into the text, as Matthew lays it out, we come into it and it's a bit of a mess in terms of what is taking place within the text. We, we come in and we find that, that there is this, this young man by the name of Joseph who, who is betrothed to a woman named Mary and, and this young sister named Mary who, who, who is young of age but, but has been blessed with this uh, um, awesome work. And if you read in Luke 2, you, you see how she recognizes this as a, as a major blessing. She has been blessed with the opportunity to carry the hope of the world, the hope of Israel, the hope of all who were looking and had this messianic hope. She, she's been blessed to carry the Savior, the Messiah, Jesus, the Son of God. And yet and still, Joseph 
The one in which she's betrothed to has no idea about these things. And so as we break into the situation, it, it, it's not necessarily this high time of praise. In all reality, it is a moment of messiness. Joseph, who uh, is, is uh, connected to Mary, betrothal is a little bit different than just engagement to be married as we understand it in, in our Western context. No, in, in their context, arrangements have been made, uh, families have discussed certain things uh, legally, it, according to Jewish law, to be betrothed to someone, it, it means to legally be bound to one another. They, they are all but married. They, they are clearly identified as husband and wife to be. All they're waiting on is a few formalities to make this thing official but but it is a legally binding thing and so what ends up happening as we are familiar with the Christmas story as Joseph has, has is looking forward to this period Mary the one in which he's betrothed to shows up pregnant and it has this appearance feel of a messy situationship. Mary shows up pregnant and it appears that, that she has been unfaithful to Joseph during this time. And, and that's a big deal. That, that's a huge deal to be unfaithful. It is a huge deal according to the law of God. If you read back in Deuteronomy 22, you'll find that an individual or a young woman who is found to be unfaithful during this betrothal period is to be taken out to the city gates and judged accordingly to her unfaithfulness. It is deemed as sinful and wrong. And so here's Joseph awaiting the formalities to take Mary as his wife. And here she is, pregnant. And this news is broken to Joseph. And if you put yourself in Joseph's shoes, you, you'd understand that Joseph is crushed and he's embarrassed. And he has to feel bad about what is taking place here. And interestingly enough, the word of God tells us, however, that Joseph is a just man. He's a righteous man. He's a good man. And being a good man, what we end up seeing is that Joseph purposes not to, not to make a big deal out of the situation even though it's a big deal. He chooses not to shame Mary. He chooses to deal with this quietly instead of loudly. He, he, he chooses uh, to operate in grace instead of revenge. He chooses to operate in mercy instead of vindication. He, he chooses to handle this in a way that, that shows grace and mercy as as opposed to trying to, to, to embarrass Mary or to put her business out in the street, he, he chooses grace. This is certainly not the main point of the message today. However, it is worth pointing out and considering deeply for our hearts and our lives, this idea that, that Joseph's heart is oriented towards grace and mercy. It's oriented it, it, towards treating someone better than they deserve. It, it, is, it is oriented towards showing someone mercy, even though you've been hurt, even though you are embarrassed, even though you have been shamed, even though you've been made to look a little foolish, it, it is beautiful to see that Joseph's heart is oriented towards grace. And it's worth us considering 
and thinking about. Are there those in our lives, are there situations or moments in our lives where we could be choosing grace instead of revenge, where we could be choosing mercy instead of vindication, where we can be choosing this idea of handling things quietly as opposed to handling them loudly. Yes, I know they've done you wrong. I know something bad has happened. I know I know they embarrassed you. I know they mistreated you. I, I get it. I understand it. Uh, but some of us are so burdened down with bitterness, so crippled under the weight of record keeping of wrongs that, that we cannot consider just a little bit that there should be moments where we can show grace instead of revenge. I'm not saying ignore it. Or overlook it. Joseph doesn't do that. Joseph has a plan. He says, I have to break the relationship. I'm going to uh, break the, the situation. That there's, um, there's not going to be a, a wedding at this point. Yet and still, Joseph uh, purposes in his heart to say, instead of hurting uh, Mary, I don't have to hurt her in order for me to heal. I don't have to embarrass her in order for me to get vindication. No, I can exercise grace instead of revenge. This is beautiful. And Joseph is a wonderful example. And yet, he actually exemplifies the character of an even better example. I continue to you today that each of us are evidence to the reality that God chooses grace and mercy over vindication and revenge all the time. That, that we are testimonies to the very reality that God operates and, and treats us with grace instead of getting even. That God looks past and, and overlooks and, and looks uh, past our, our, our sin offenses and treats us with mercy. I'll be the example. I am a witness to the realities that when I have messed up and jacked up, that although I go to God's throne expecting judgment, what I get instead is a throne of, of mercy and grace. When, when I've messed up like a son who squandered the goodness of his father, when I go back with my my head hanging low in shame and guilt. I am so glad that my father stands there with open arms extended, ready to welcome me back in to his loving kindness and grace and mercy. All of us, all of us, even if we don't realize it or not, all of us are, are statements to the grace, grace and mercy of God, to his goodness. It, it, is, it is a statement and we are statements to the reality that even in our mess ups, even in our mistakes, that even when we take our mess ups to God, we find that he has more grace to cover up our mess ups. Oh, how we are, we are witnesses and testimonies to this reality that we find forgiveness where we don't deserve forgiveness. Where we find mercy where we don't deserve mercy. We find love and forgiveness and grace where we don't deserve any of those things. And so, yes, as a result, it is powerful to to us to recognize that, that if God has shown this type of grace in the face of our offenses, how much more can we show grace to others when they have mistreated and done us wrong? So Joseph resolves, however, this is what I'll do. I see what Mary has done, something is wrong here. I'm going to dismiss myself from this situation. 
I'm going to leave her alone, and I'm going to go my way. However, in verse 20, we are told that Joseph goes to bed, and in his slumber, he is visited by an angel of God in his sleep. This brings us to one of uh, the reminders that we get from this text about Christmas. Christmas is a wonderful reminder that God's plans are always bigger than our moments of trouble. Here's Joseph. He's betrothed to be married, knows it's coming up. He finds himself getting the news that the young lady that he's committed to is now pregnant. He's, he's undoubtedly shamed by this, embarrassed by this, but he chooses mercy and grace and how he's going to handle this situation. Goes to bed, and an angel shows up and appears to him in a dream. The word of God says that the angel says, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Key phrase is there is that The angel calls Joseph, number one, by name. Joseph, son of David. Joseph, carpenter by trade, but he's a member of the house of David, which is important because here it's it's the angel is, is kind of popping into his mind and reminding him, okay, you know uh, who you are, you know who you come from, you know the lineage, uh, uh, and, and, and you know exactly your, your family tree, you, you understand that, and, and yet uh, I want you to understand while you're planning to take Mary as your wife, and it seems like all of those plans have been blown up. Seems like you're going through this moment of shame and embarrassment. Seems like everything has fallen down uh, in front of you. I I know you're not going to make a big fuss about it, but you've made plans. You're going to go to one of the priests. You're going to get a certificate of divorce. You're going to get out this thing. You're going to let Mary live her life. You're going to go live yours. You're going to find another situation that you can work out, but but the angels says, but hold up, Joseph, I want you to understand something more is happening here. I, I, I see that you've got this, this plan to, to figure it out, even though I appreciate your good heart and how you're handling it. I appreciate how, how you've got this idea laid out of how you'll handle this well and honorably. I appreciate But even still, I want you to understand there's a bigger plan at play. I want you to understand that you don't have to be afraid. What's happening here is not a moment of unfaithfulness. What's happening here is not a messy situation. I need you to put on another set of lenses Here, Joseph, I I need you to look at this from a different perspective. What is happening here is much bigger than your wedding. The young woman that you're betrothed to, she's not pregnant as a matter of unfaithfulness. She's pregnant as a result of the Holy Spirit. How does this apply to us? Many of us are going through many things. Certainly moments of trouble and difficulty. Maybe moments of pain, moments of of trial, moments of darkness, moments of struggle, moments where we're confused at, at 
what's happening and God, how are you working things out? What, what's going on right now? And, and many of us are, are developing plans on how we're going to navigate through these situations, how we're going to figure them out, how we're going to fix them. And yet and still, I, I want us to understand that Christmas reminds us the story for which we as believers celebrate. It reminds us that oftentimes, even though we are having moments of trouble and difficulty and pain and confusion, God still has a plan. That God is still working out something bigger. I'm not foolish enough to declare what God is working out, but I can tell you that the promises of the Word of God tells us that He's working it all out for our good. So we can rest in the reality that even in our moments of trouble and confusion, we can be reminded of the truth that God has a plan. We can be encouraged in these moments that God is still working things out. We, we can be, we can walk and be strengthened by, by the idea that the God sees high, sits higher and he looks and, and sees everything and he has the plan laid out. And so we can walk even in our moments of trouble, trusting in the shepherd who's walking with us. We are reminded of this truth. No matter what we're going through, just like Joseph, we can be, we can be assured that God has a bigger plan. God is working it out for our good. That God is active and working on our behalf. May not be the way you've got in your plan. May, may not be in, in the way that you think it should work out. But, but I can tell you it'll be for your good and for his glory. I can tell you, you'll, you'll look back on your life and you'll, you'll say, man, I, um, I, I couldn't have got here unless God had worked it out how I was navigating throughout what I was navigating through. God has a bigger plan. Secondly, Christmas not only reminds us that God has a plan even in the midst of our moments of trouble, it reminds us of God's provision for our salvation. This is a message that never gets old and never should get old. This is a message that should never get lost on us. It should never escape our hearts of gratitude and praise. In verse 22, we see the angel declares what the purpose of this child would be. The angel proclaims. In verse 21. Excuse me. That Mary will bear a son. And you'll call his name Jesus. For he will save his people. From their sins. If Christmas reminds us of anything. It reminds us that Jesus came to mankind's defense and help. Came to be mankind's salvation. Came to save us from our sins. Jesus came to make us right before God where we cannot be right before God on our own. The word of God is clear. It is clear that, that we should understand Jesus' arrival into humanity onto earth to live a perfect and sinless life, to go all the way to the cross, to take his perfection and make a glorious exchange for anybody who places their faith in what Jesus does on the cross and out of the grave as being the sacrifice for their sins. It, it, 
see, it is that that we should understand. We should understand is God's gift to us. The word of God is clear. We must understand that that's God's gift. In 2 Corinthians 9.15, Paul writes, Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Romans 6.23, he writes again that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Joseph and Mary, they, they, they were good. He, he is a good brother, just brother. Mary was a good sister. She was favored and devout. However, even in all of their goodness as a couple, they deserve no credit for God's provision for our salvation. This, brothers and sisters, is the gift of of God, This is God's divine present to you and I. The fingerprint of humanity would have jacked this thing up if we tried to save ourselves. And yet what we see in the advent of Jesus, in the coming of Jesus, what we celebrate on this time of year and during this time of year in Jesus' coming is that we are celebrating that, that God uh, has said, to humanity I will take care of it it is the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit coming up with a plan of divinity to say I will fix the situation I will make right what man can't make right on their own it is the triune God saying we figured out a way to make this thing right. It is God's way of saying we will send the gift, deliver the gift, and be the gift that humanity needs for its salvation. Without receiving Jesus through faith in what he's done on the cross and out of the grave, without receiving those things in faith, we stand disconnected from God. There's no forgiveness for our sins. We're left to drown in our guilt and shame for the things we have done wrong and or, or we're trying to left trying to calculate how much good have I done to outweigh my my bad. There's, there's no way in which we we find ourselves actually making up a, enough perfection to get to God and to stand in the presence of God and have a relationship with with God, we can't do that on our own. And yet, God has said, I will be a gift to humanity in the person and through the work of Jesus Christ to make it that we, we who are hopeless outside of him can have a gift of hope for eternal life with him. We're meant, brothers and sisters, and this is meant to motivate our heart of worship during this time. We are meant to understand what God has done as, as a glorious gift to us. We're meant to understand this as an amazing, amazing uh, uh, work of benevolence. We are meant to understand that we are beneficiaries of the grace and, and goodness of God through the sending of Jesus Christ to be the provision for our salvation, to save us from our sins. We are meant to understand that Jesus is our great and glorious gift. We're meant to understand Jesus as the great hero of our story. We're meant to understand him as our knight in shining armor, our lifesaver, the one who takes a bullet on our behalf, the good shepherd who lays down his life for us and guides us into green pastures, our 
bread that forever satisfies our deepest hunger, our living water from a well that never runs dry, that forever quenches our thirst, the door and the way that gives us access to God, the physician, the physician that, that heals us from all our sickness and pain, the medicine that cures all of our soul's most difficult and dirtiest diseases, the, the light that scares away the darkness and evil in us and around us, our answer to the curse of sin, death, and judgment, the vine that connects us to God and keeps us connected to God. Jesus is our gift that continues to keep on giving. And that's what we're supposed to understand and celebrate. If we understand that meaning, we will be motivated to worship him well. God has provided through Jesus the glorious gift of our salvation. Let me ask, have you received that gift? Have you embraced that gift? The word of God tells us that God loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him, they, they won't perish, but instead they will receive everlasting life. It's God's gift to you. The question becomes, will you receive it? Will you receive it in faith? Will you receive it in all of its goodness and glory? Will you understand and comprehend that, that God loves you enough that, that he doesn't want you to be hopeless. He doesn't want to leave you uh, just to yourself. But no, he understands that, that you can't fix your, your problem. He understands that in order to have a relationship with him, it requires perfection. And, and we as, as individuals are incapable of being perfect. And so God says, I'll take care of that for you. I'll provide my son to be perfection for you you so that through faith in him he will give you his perfect righteousness his perfect goodness so that you can have a relationship with me this is my gift to you have you received it it's available by placing your faith in him in verse 22 we read Commentary here, Matthew, Holy Spirit inspired. It says all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. The final reminder that I want to leave you with today that Christmas gives us is that God's presence makes the difference. Presence, I don't mean it in the term of gift, although it is a gift. But I mean presence in the sense of God being with us makes the difference. I love how when we read this text, that it's almost written as if immediately Joseph, as he's awakened from his sleep, having heard this declaration of the angel, you know, Joseph, that something bigger is taking place here. This isn't about you. This isn't about unfaithfulness. This isn't messy, but this is actually God's masterpiece at work. That Joseph, he, he awakes, and it's almost as if he walks with, with, with a, um, a sense of assurance. Well, now that I know that, that this is about God's presence being with us, it, it makes this huge difference in his spirit and his mind and his attitude that he says, okay, I can go ahead and go forward in faith in this moment. 
I, I can walk out my, my obligations. I can remain connected. I, I, I'll take her as my wife because I trust that, that this is ushering in God's presence among his people and to be the salvation of his people. And so I'm good now. God's presence makes the difference. And I say all that to, to say this here. If you're waffling at all on whether or not you'll receive the free gift of God and the person of Jesus Christ. The gift in which as Christians and believers we celebrate during this time. We don't care about Santa or Christmas trees. All of that stuff is just fun to us. But what we truly celebrate is that God has, has provided an amazing gift for our salvation. A powerful gift that, 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 that makes a huge, huge difference in our lives. A gift that, that uh, makes, once we intersect with it, it, it changes the dynamics of our lives. Where, where we once were shackled by fear and, and, and concern and, 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 and anxiety, now what has to give way is the peace that only the Prince of Peace can give. Where once we were shackled by worry about what's coming down the line or, or, or how or we are going to be all right. Now we have been able to, to experience the great and glorious wonderful counselor. One of comfort. The one that brings joy when it seems like there's nothing to have joy about. Why? Because God's presence makes the difference. Many of us who found ourselves in, with lives that have seemed to have been broken into pieces and yet and still we've experienced the work of a Savior who's seemingly put it back together better than it was before. We, we, we glory in that reality. We're testimonies that he's an amazing fixer. He's an amazing physician. He's an amazing keeper. He's an amazing helper. Why? Because we realize that God God's presence makes the difference. The other day, as we're celebrating the advent of Jesus, and we're spending time as a family working through um, our devotion, my wife um, felt led and compelled to share with our kids her testimony of salvation. It was in that time that she began to, to weep during that time that she shared her story, what God had done on her behalf and the love that she had experienced. And hearing the good news of the gospel that Jesus had come for her salvation. She began to tell us about through tears how God, how God had changed her life. How, how things had been different as a result of the presence of God. I only share that to say that God's presence makes the difference. And this is what we celebrate during this holiday season is the truth and reality that it's not about lights or any of those things. What it's truly about is the amazing gift that has been given to us in the person of Jesus Christ. That he's come. He came from a manger and took it all the way to a cross and then out of a grave Ascend it back to heaven so that we can have hope where we've been hopeless, peace where we've been anxious, and joy where we had no joy. My call to you today was would you receive that gift? If you haven't received that gift, if you have received that gift, that you celebrate that gift. 
We're blessed because God's presence makes the difference. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your son. Thank you that it's that in which we celebrate during this time of year. That you're a God of grace, God of goodness, who sees what we need, who saw what we need, and provided an answer, provided a solution that we could be right where we couldn't get right on our own. There's one that's watching, Lord God. I pray that you'd move upon their hearts if they've never received that gift. To embrace that gift, draw them to you in a way that only you can do. We ask these things in the matchless and powerful name of Jesus we pray. Amen. God bless you, family. Have a wonderful Christmas and have a wonderful week.